go ahead and call the select board meeting to order for Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. And I just have to state that this meeting is being recorded and in, in, in attendance is David Phil, John Muskevitz, Jane Nevinsmith, Christian Stanley, and Joyce Chunglo from the select board. Uh, just a reminder, if you're not speaking, keep your uh, microphone on mute, please. And uh, we'll do all votes via roll call votes, which Jennifer will call. So go ahead and get started. Uh, first order of business is the consent agenda. Uh, I don't see the warrants in there. Are we, do we have those Jennifer or we, was mine just not updated? We don't, we don't have warrants for tonight. Okay, no big deal. All right, but what we do have is the uh, restorative justice program details from the Hadley Police Department. And that's it for the consent agenda. If I could get a motion to approve that. So moved. Second. Okay, motion by Jane, second by Christian. And any discussion on this? Yeah. Okay, Jennifer, will you call it? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Oh. Uh, I think that Joyce fell off of the meeting, so um, we'll get her back on, but Stanley? Yes. Waskevitz? Yes. And Nevin Smith? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we'll, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wait uh, for Joyce. Joyce. Um, Carolyn, do you want to do your town administrator's update now while we have a minute waiting for Joyce? Okay. I did receive an email from Richard Massey right before I got on the, um, the meeting. to get. He did provide some update on some of the concerns you all had on October 28th select board meeting. So he did uh, go into some detail. I did not go in depth, but literally just opened it up before I got on. So I'll send that out to you, but there is some uh, responses to some of those concerns you had. David and I met with, um, had kind of a Zoom meet and greet with Senator Comerford last week. Um, and um, just some more follow-up from her office to help us with as we look forward to, uh, look forward to or, uh, look ahead to the widening project to help with um, some of the replacement of the, the water pipes there. So um, she's been very good with her staff to uh, communicate back with us. So that'll be, it'll be helpful to have some of those resources. And um, David and I actually spent a lot of time today going over reviewing where Hadley was with the revenues, the, um, the revenue streams and where we were at. He is, I would say, very close to the targets that he had set in the spring, like I'd mentioned before. Um, some of the areas are lower than expected, knowing that David had estimated much lower um, so that we would have a good estimate for this year. Um, but it is a little bit early to tell. And again, we're not, each month is going to be different. So um, by next month, we'll have any, a better idea of where we're at. Um, and then just we, we talked about it's time for uh, the select board to start um, thinking about what your goals are for FY22 so we can start working on that budget. So I would just ask that um, you guys begin to think about what your goals are for next year. So that's okay. the report. All right, and Joyce is back. So let's move forward. Joyce, you just missed the uh, consent agenda and the administrator's report. So we'll go ahead and... <laughs> Great. <laughs> Did we skip over public comment already, too? I was waiting for you. So we're, we'll go ahead and do uh, public comments now. Um, 15 minutes. Please limit your comments to three minutes so that others may have the opportunity. If anybody's here for public comments, uh, turn on your camera or make yourself known. Dylan, you had something? Yes. Uh, just wanted to follow up uh, earlier with the letter of concern, uh, expand on it if anyone had questions. Uh, but just the finance committee, Amy, Biden, and I, as well as some other people uh, that I talked to on the finance committee, uh, shared a similar concern. Just wanted to send a letter 
uh, worried about the precedent that the end of Saturday's meeting might lead to future uh, town meetings uh, being derailed. And also wanted to uh, stress the importance of the timeline for the COVID rental relief. Uh, that is a time pressing uh, thing, which we do have uh, a suggested uh, alternative. Uh, if you want me to go into that now or, or wait? Yeah, uh, go ahead and take the time now. Yeah, so um, Molly Keegan, uh, myself, uh, Molly had been reaching out to David, uh, sorry, to uh, Bill Dwyer uh, and was looking into if the the newly formed affordable housing trust fund could be used uh, as a temporary solution to fund uh, the COVID rental relief. Uh, Bill is currently looking into that uh, from my understanding uh, to try to see if that is within uh, the trusts uh, in the way it's written. Um, so waiting to hear back from that, uh, but that might be an option so we don't have to uh, let people go without any sort of financial relief until spring town meeting. Uh, Dylan, have have you looked into, um, it was brought to my attention through uh, Facebook's comments and things, that there is affordable housing relief for people. There's like $65 million in um, public funds from RAFT and IRMA uh, that people can tap into. Yes, yes. Molly and I did see that. We discussed that with CAPV. Um, they believe that there is an opportunity to kind of fill some gaps with some funding uh, that would come through CPA that wouldn't be uh, available through the state. So they're recommending that we follow the same precedent that was set by uh, several other towns in Massachusetts to provide some sort of rental relief within our town itself. So can you, can you tell me uh, approximately how many people would be affected by this? We never did get to discuss and um, I'm going to take, just this moment, Dylan, for a second mm -hmm. to uh, apologize to um, you and other people that had their warrants on that got uh, delayed because John Waskevich called for a quorum. Um, I think that it was above and beyond what he should have done. I think it was not fair to the people. I may not have agreed with some of the articles or whatever, but that's not up to me. That was up to the people that were there. We have never called a quorum, and I can't think of, in 32 years I've been in politics. So I was really disheartened that uh, people didn't have the opportunity, the planning board, CPA, and people had a chance to present their articles. Um, and so I'm sorry, I wanna apologize on my part uh, and for other people on the board of selectmen that this took place. So accept my apology, please. Yeah, and so to answer the question, uh, just keep it. Wait a minute, Joyce. First of all, the quorum has been called in past town meetings, in annual town meetings and in special town meetings. The people come and vote for what they want to, and then they leave. And then everything else gets stuffed on the taxpayers' throats. That's the problem. The only reason why I called was the last number for the lawnmower for DPW out of capital. I wrote down the numbers and I got them. Didn't add up to 100. So either somebody didn't vote or there wasn't 100 people there. And it's been called before. So don't attack me because there wasn't a quorum at the town meeting. I am going to attack you because I think it was unfair of you, John to do that to other people and to the planning board that you called it. So we already had shortened that meeting and made it short so that people could do their presentations. And I think that was wrong. So period, let's get over it and move on. Joyce, so, uh, your answer your question about the number of people impacted. Um, CAPV has done this program with Amherst and they're setting one up with East Hampton. They said that the demand is one of the more difficult things to uh, figure out. Uh -huh. That said, part of the mechanism of the article as written was if the funds were not used, uh, that they would be returned to the CPA. Uh, we thought that was a, uh, a good workaround. The uh -huh. limit right now, the way it's written, was two years. Uh, uh -huh. Molly, Keegan, and I have discussed, and if COVID is resolved in six months or we see little to no demand, we would not feel any worried by sending that back earlier. Um, uh -huh. We don't want to hold on to funds and we don't want to hold on to taxpayer dollars if they're 
not going to be used. We're just trying to set up a program. If the demand's there, we would love to help people. Uh, this, and if it's not, then we'd like to return the funds. All right, so my, my, my uh, David, my right. thoughts on this, um, for the articles that were not able to be presented at this fall town meeting, I would like to make a mo. is this appropriate at this time? I'd like sure. to make a motion that these articles be the first on the agenda for Springtown meeting to, instead of always putting the planning board last, please let them go first. Maybe people will stay longer if they have to have their articles at the end that don't, you know, that mean the most to them. So let's put planning. I mean, we appreciate planning board. Please let's put these on first at the Springtown meeting. All right. So you're saying oh, all the yeah. items that were pushed off would be first. Yes. Okay. You know, Joyce, we've discussed this in past meetings. That hey, the on, I, have a, I have a motion on. I have a motion on the table. Second. Second. Second by Jane. Okay, John, go ahead. You know, we've discussed this before in in, in other meetings that the controversial uh, articles should be last, so most of the people will stay. And we've never done that. Well, I'm making a motion now that we do it. Are you in agreement? Yes, I am in agreement with that. Great. Sure. All right. Motion on the table. All right. So um, motion second by Jane. Any further discussion on this one? All those in favor, roll call vote. Aye. Oh, Hold on. we got to wait, wait for Jennifer. We can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. I think you disconnected. You probably wanted to run for her life. <laughs> no. Can't hear you, Jennifer. All right. Uh, Carolyn, can you call it for us, please? So, uh, just the roll call for David. She's off, too. Great. She's muted. You're on mute. I know. It takes me time. There we go. <laughs> Okay, roll call vote, vote John. Uh, yes. Jane? Yes. Joyce? Yes. David? Yes. And I don't see, is Christian on? Yeah, he's there. There he is. Christian? Yes. Okay. What's that? We got, we got everybody, right? All right. Okay, so that's taken care of. Um, real quick before we move on from that, uh, I see Bill DeWire's here. Bill, do you have any light you can shed on whether that affordable housing trust fund can be used for rental assistance? Um, just to put things in perspective, <clears throat> as you know, the, um, the affordable housing trust fund committee or board has not met since we were approved at the annual town meeting. Uh, I have not looked at uh, the terms recently uh, so I don't have an opinion. I'm not saying yes or no, uh, but I also want to clarify that since the board has not met, we're not really taking a, we can't take a position. We can't have taken a position. The members of the board who are on the planning board have agreed to call for a meeting. And at that meeting, there can be a discussion about whether this is a goal that the committee supports or not. By that time, I will have some uh, guidance or clear, uh, clearer idea of what we can do. I know in other communities, uh, the rental assistance is funded in part through CPA and in part through affordable housing trust funds, but that depends on the operative language of each uh, trust fund create, uh, creation foundation document. So uh, we will have to look into it. Uh, we'll have an answer by the time we meet, hopefully the week of December 7th. And um, then we can talk about uh, whether we have the authority to do this. And if we do have the authority, is this what we want to do? And then it will come back to the select board after that because the affordable housing uh, committee per se has very limited spending authority. Everything has to be ratified by either the select board or a prior vote of town meeting. And in this case, we'd be looking to the select board as a whole um, for uh, ratification of whatever we may 
decide to do. So there, there are several steps uh, ahead of us, and I wouldn't want anticipation that this might be the solution to deter anyone from exploring other paths. How much is available, Bill, if that did, uh, uh, we were able to tap into that? Do you know how much there would be available? I, I don't know exactly. Uh, it's in the uh, $300,000 range based on the payments that have been coming in from Barry Roberts for his um, uh, East Street Commons. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, and going forward, the uh, an Affordable Housing Trust Fund does have statutory authority to take over the management of the affordable housing component of the um, um, CPA. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that's another route to explore down the road. We're not that's something we're proposing at this point. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, just ballpark numbers this time. We'll have more definite numbers when we finally um, do meet. Okay, so thank you. What I'd like to ask of the select board is if kind of in, um, and, and I know this may not materialize depending how the trust and the committee goes. Uh, Christian and I, I think are both on that uh, affordable housing trust fund committee and I'm not sure who else, but um, if we could make a motion to uh, show our support of using $100,000 of that affordable trust fund to kind of hold us over on the rental assistance aspect of things until the CPA article can be taken up at town meeting. So maybe put a, a year timeline and then it'll be you know returned back to the trust fund, something along those lines. If someone could make a motion along those lines, I think it would be at least showing support of, of this effort to the uh, committee before it actually meets. I'll make, I'll make a motion that the select board um, encourages the um, affordable Trust Act, committee, Affordable Trust Committee to um, consider using $100,000 of that money to support COVID rental relief until the CPA article can be uh, voted on at Springtown meeting and should the CPA article pass to return any unused money to Affordable Trust at that time. I'll second that. All right, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any other further discussion on that? Maybe we ought to have a work uh, uh, committee uh, for the rentals, just like we have for the seniors. I, I couldn't hear you, John. Sorry. What was it? I said we got a work pro work off program for the seniors. Maybe we should have that for the rentals too. The senior work off program offers five hundred dollars a year. I don't think we're talking the same numbers. I I just know that we don't have a use for the affordable housing trust fund balance at this point. Now, granted, we just you know we don't want to spend it all on one thing, but kind of like we took uh, a little bit of money out of the stabilization fund. Uh, you know, it might be worth uh, looking at taking a little bit of money out of that trust fund for for these purposes, uh, at least until we can let the voters decide at uh, Springtown meeting. So that's that's just my thoughts. Um, anything else on this? And that right. that also that also, though, um, from Susan is also available from uh, to renters to do the work off program also. So it's not just for people that own their own homes as people that live in town and they can also apply for the work off um, for that purpose also. So that is an option also. But wouldn't that, I guess the seniors are working off their taxes they own on their property. If they're a renter, they wouldn't have any taxes other than maybe uh, vehicle taxes, right? Correct. I'm not so. sure what Susan text something um susan can you are you on susan yeah yeah i am uh, the senior tax work off is only to reduce the real estate property tax okay it can't by law go anywhere else okay. okay good to know thank you okay all right so 
Jennifer, if you're connected, could you call the vote, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. All right. Phil? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Evan Smith? Yes. Sorry right. about that before. That's okay. All right. So any other public comments before we move on? And uh, Dylan and Molly, thanks for working up, or coming up with that idea of, of using that. So not something that I thought of. So thank you guys for sharing this evening. Right. Last call, public comments? Nope. Okay. Um, I am going to jump to, we have a 6 p.m tax hearing, but I'm going to jump to uh, Young Men's Club licenses. I see uh, Johnny Mitch is here. I try to squeeze him in before our 6 p.m. hearing. So uh, the Young Men's Club wanted to come before us to talk about, uh, I think, licensing issues. So John, if you're there. <coughs> he had joined. Yeah. All right. I think I'm on there now. Is. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I, we're in receipt of the renewal letter um, for 2021 for our fees for the Young Men's Club. And I just want to first of all say I appreciate the town taking the initiative to offer a 25% discount uh, on them for this year, coming up year. One of the things I would like to request for us on behalf of the Young Men's Club is if we could maybe get more of a discount for this year only because last year uh, we paid the $2,100 worth of licenses plus the $100 for the Board of Health. And we were only able to use it for uh, one quarter, you know, till March, till we were shut down. <clears throat> so we used it for 25% last year and 75% of the year we have lost. I don't see us opening uh, before the, the year end with everything going on. So I would request that we maybe get a waiver for our fees for 2021. Okay. Can we do anything where we would prorate the fees? So once you guys opened, and I guess this is a question for more Carolyn and David is, can we do anything where once they open, um, we just prorate the fee for that time period as opposed to eliminating it or discounting it or something because of all the unknowns, like you said. Jennifer may, yeah, go ahead. Carol. I was going to say Jennifer can, or David that I, I can't answer that. Uh, in the past, the select board has uh, prorated licenses. Um, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, the, the Young Men's Club would have to submit the $200 application fee for ABCC and then they don't pay for the license until they don't uh, get the license until they've uh, paid for it through the town. Is that the procedure? You know, they're not asking to, to let their license go. They're asking for the select board to either lower the fee or reduce the fee. So there's no charge to the ABCC at all. It's all town monies um you know i i talked to, to johnny about this and I, I made a couple of recommendations um the select board it is in your purview it's, it's y'all's license you can decide if you want to reduce the fees more than the 25 percent or if you would like to leave them where they are um if if the young men's club is keeping their liquor license um it has to be renewed in 12 days so this is a a time sensitive decision, but it, it, it is up to y'all. I will say that um, the Legion and the Young Men's Club are two clubs in town and they have a club license. And so that makes them a little bit different than anybody else um, than any of our other liquor licenses. So it really is up to the select board what their pleasure is here. Yeah, I'd like to. We're going to take it uh, per establishment. Uh, per establishment um, as they were opening or closing or for however long they were going to be closed. I thought we had discussed this once before. I, I think that it's 
under our purview. And I think that um, we as a select board, we have the Legion and the Young Men's Club, and I know we're taking right now the Young Men's Club. Um, they have always um, been a very big participant in town activities. They've allowed the school department to use their fields. Um, they have given out scholarships um, and supported many other activities that have been in town. And I think it would be of the best interest that we support them now at this time and um, prorate them to whenever they do open up um, and grant them a waiver at this time until of an opening that might be hopefully in the spring when maybe some of this COVID stuff is, um, I, I could use another word, but I won't, um, has gone uh, and under better control than what it is right now. Um, so I would, you know, um, ask the select board to think of a waiver for them at this point uh, until they are up and running because they are good um, Hadley participants in all activities. So, you know, let's keep that in mind. The only thing I would say is uh, I'd like to include the Legion. Um, and to be clear, yes. I'm not a Legion or a Young Men's Club member, but um, I'd like to include both of them as the two nonprofits in town that operate as clubs. Um, and if someone could make a motion to prorate it on a monthly basis, I, think I have that a would question be before the motion, Jennifer. It, would it make life different if they paid like $25 fee now and then we prorate later so they paid something to start the licensing process? As long as y'all make this, as long as you make this vote and that's the decision that you're making, I still have to have the paperwork back, but we can prorate it and take it up at that time. Can I just interject for just a minute? If, if we're going to prorate, is there any possibility that we get prorated for what we paid last year? And and not to differentiate us in the Legion as much, you know, I, I understand the Legion is also a nonprofit. Uh, the Legion doesn't pay real estate taxes. We're current with all of our real estate taxes with the town. Um, I've been working with the assessors to try to get the same accommodation as the Legion has to help us offset expenses as well. But again, we paid $2,200 last year, or 2100 last year for our licenses, which weren't used really at all. So if we could prorate that and maybe apply that to the 2021. Okay, so you use the license from, let's say, from January to March of last March 16th. year. March 16th, yes. And so for the rest of the year, prorate it um, and like negate actually this whole year, let's say that from March until December at this point um, and prorated at that point. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have my calculator on me right now, but Susan, are you still on? I, I think we're gonna create issues going back in time. I, I don't have an issue going forward um, and just, you know, do the application fee and then I'm good with just an application fee until we can open again. But I mean, we're going to have restaurants that were shut down and everybody else under the sun coming, coming to us and asking to prorate back in time. We're going to have big, big problems. All uh, right. So let's, so let's just say $25 for the young men's club and the Legion let's lump them together right now so that we can make one motion. Um, not saying that they're in involved in this, and just say that that's the fee for next year until if and when you do open up again. Susan, did you want to say Was that a motion? Yeah. Yes. How do you like that one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so could, could you think of something better for question? <laughs> can, can I get a second, please? I'll second. All right, second by Jane, and then Susan, you had something? Oh, no, okay, sorry. Just for discussion, I am just concerned about what this does as setting a precedent for other, um, you know, license holders, but these are two clubs that are in town to differentiate them for-profit businesses, but it is a little bit of a sticky situation that it does put us in, so. Um, well, that's my thing on this. Maybe Susan has a comment on that. 
And because of the nature of their business, they're considered mostly bars. So there is no food, food service or that type of thing. Uh, whereas other holders of liquor licenses have food service. So they've been able to uh, continue business to some extent. And there's also there's also the um, the fact that these two more than all the businesses in town have always been very supportive, but these two clubs are really supportive of all town activities. You need something, you go to one of them, and they come in and help. Correct. They absolutely do, and they and both of them support the churches as well, uh, the food pantries and that type of thing. So, correct. The legions have done the parades forever, and the Young Men's Club has donated the baseball and softball fields forever since they were built. So, If we can't support our own, we might as well just bail out now. So let's get this done right now. Let's do a $25 fee for the year, and that be it. And Until they can open, right? Correct. Okay. It, I want to be clear, and at that time, we will prorate the fee. We will look at it then, yes. We'll, okay, you will look at it then, okay. All right, anything further on that? Johnny, is that a good uh, step in the right direction for you guys? That is a good step in the right direction. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, can you call the vote, please? Yes. Uh, roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Jungle? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks, Johnny. And um, I'm going to move on. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, Johnny, and we'll get the paperwork to you, Jennifer. Okay. That's it. That's what I wanted. I wanted to remind you, you still have to turn in the paperwork. Yes, we'll get it to you. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, I'm going to squeeze in the senior tax work off because I see Haley's uh, waiting. Uh, sorry, the assessor's in the uh, collector's office, but it shouldn't take too long. So, um, Haley, do you want to talk about this, about as far as the tax work-off program? You're muted. You're muted. No? Nope. Can you hear me? There we go. Okay. 2021 would be the third year that we're offering the program to area seniors who are homeowners, um, seniors 60 and over, offering them um, $500 um, off their real estate property taxes in exchange for, um, I think, 41.66 hours of work um, at the um, at the minimum wage set for the state of Massachusetts for various departments who might have jobs um, that they propose for these seniors. Last year we had one taker and she worked for the town administrator and she is a very skilled um, technical writer and she helped prepare the annual report and some other, and some other writing tasks. Um, so I'm just, my proposal is that we um, increase slightly the the income level threshold for eligibility, which is based, which has been based the last two years on the income eligibility for the fuel assistance program, which you've all have access to if you want to look at that table. Um, so that's it. It's pretty simple. Okay. I move we accept these changes. Second. By Joyce. Any other discussion or questions on the senior tax work off updated program? Okay. Jennifer, will you call the vote, please? Roll call vote. Uh, Phil? Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Yes. Stanley? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Evanston. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ellie. Okay.
Okay, so moving on, let's go and move into 5.1, the tax classification hearing, which was posted for 6 p.m. this evening. And I'm sure Dan, the assessor, wants to start off and give us his usual uh, presentation with a whole lot of data. Maybe. <laughs> he left the Dan, meeting. Oh, there we go, he's sharing his screen. We can't hear you, Dan. Yeah, nope, I wasn't. I wasn't talking. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me go through the slides. This slide, the presentation was done before the special town meeting, so I wasn't sure what numbers were going to be used by town meeting or approved at town meeting. So the presentation that follows is based on the the actual numbers that were passed, the twelve dollar tax rate. Dan, can um, you speak up just a little yep. bit? I'm having a little trouble here. Yep. How's that? Much better. Uh, before we begin, a few facts about fiscal 21. Our tax levy, the maximum tax levy would be 13,107,695. Our residential value is 698,502,000. The residential levy share is 8.7 million. The commercial, industrial, and personal property value is 352,168,000. And the CINP levy share is just under 4.4 million. If a single rate is adopted tonight, the estimated tax rate will be $12 for all classes of property. The average single family home in Hadley is assessed for 350,200 and the average bill will be 4,202,240. ,200. If the maximum shift were adopted, the residential rate would drop to 897 and the commercial industrial and personal rate would increase to $18. Just a note, splitting the tax rate will not increase tax revenue in Hadley. The only way that the levy can increase is the annual 2.5% allowable increase, any allowable new growth for new construction, any approved debt exclusion, or any general override vote. A quick history of the, the split tax rate. The split tax rate originated after the passage of two and a half in 1990. Two and a half requires that all assessments be at full and fair market value. Prior to 1982, many communities engaged in disproportionate assessment policies. Commercial and industrial properties were assessed at full and fair market value, while residential properties were assessed at a fraction of their value. When two and a half was enacted, the residential tax burden in large communities skyrocketed while the commercial burden decreased significantly. This caused politicians to worry about getting reelected, so special legislation was passed to allow communities to legally tax commercial properties at a rate of up to 150% of what their single tax rate would be. This chart shows what two properties pre and post Prop 2.5 would have paid based on a typical full and fair for commercial pre 2.5 and full and fair for both after. So two properties that were worth the same amount, one residential, one commercial, the residential would pay 2,000, the commercial would pay eight for a total tax of 10. Post two and a half, both properties would have been assessed the same and would have a tax bill of $5,000 each. By splitting the rate to the max, the residential only went from 2,000 to 2,500 and the commercial only dropped by 500 to 7,500. This is a quick uh, chart showing what our tax levy is for this year. It's last year's levy of 11.6 plus our 2.5% increase of 290, our new growth of 164,803. That's the levy subtotal for 12,077,000. We add in the debt exclusions and the water sewer exclusions to get our maximum levy of 13,107,000. And our levy ceiling, which is if we had a $25 tax rate, is $24,542,277. This slide shows the breakdown of property based on its state use code with residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property is not listed, but the total is on the bottom. Each year, the select board must vote on how to allocate the tax levy in Hadley between all classes of property. 
there's four options that you have, the selection of a minimum residential factor, which is a split rate, an open space discount, a residential exemption, and a small commercial exemption. The minimum residential factor is the lowest percentage of the tax levy that can be borne by the residential and open space classes. For FY21, that's 74.79% for Hadley. So you may adopt a, a factor between one and 0 0.747910. A factor of one will have a single rate of $12 and the 7.747910 would decrease residential taxes by about 25% and increase commercial by 50%. This chart is a, an indication as to what happened in values in the last 10 or so years. As you can see, the residential open space percentage went from 65.3 last year to 66.4% this year. This is due to an increase in residential values while commercial and industrial values pretty much held constant. And we did not have a large influx of commercial growth this year, where usually we have something big in the past years. Last year, we had the Homewood Suites, which we didn't have anything of that size this year. This next slide is showing what last year's tax bill was for many, or several communities in our area. We were at 4202. Communities that split their rate are a little bit lower than us, except for Westfield, which is about $500 higher. If they had a single rate though, those communities would be in the, the low to mid twenties for a tax rate, which is the second column from the end. The communities that split the rate had an average bill of 47.20. After the split rate, it dropped to 37.89. So they, they saw about a $900 decrease in their taxes. There's also an additional option. If you split the rate, you can vote to shift chapter 61, 61A and 61B, which is agricultural, forestry and open space or open recreational land into the open space class, which would reduce the tax burden on these parcels. So they would have the residential rate rather than the commercial rate. This chart shows two parcels that are farmed, both farmed, but one is in chapter, the five acre parcel and one two and a half acre that is not. The assessment for 20 would have been 143.2 and 5,500 for the chapter parcel. And you can see if there's a shift, how much the non-chapter parcel would go up, whereas the chapter parcel really doesn't see a huge increase. This chart shows the different residential factor and the tax rates for 5% shifts from a single rate all the way up to the maximum of 150. A few of the, uh, the other options you have is the open space discount. We can grant an additional discount of 25% to all open space parcels. Hadley has no parcels that we've classified as open space. During a prior certification, the assessors reclassified all open space property into the other classes, either vacant land, residential, commercial, or industrial. The Department of Revenue had recommended doing this. And we really, before that, we had a few parcels and the value was minimal on those parcels. The select board can also grant a residential exemption, which is an exemption up to 35% of the, the average assessed residential value to all owner occupied, which is their person's principal resident residence uh, in all Hadley. The open space discount, the board has the option of granting the 25% discount to open space. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, the residential exemption is a reduction of up to 35% of the average residential property value. This result reduction would put it result in a higher tax rate for residential properties and in effect shift the tax burden from lower valued homes to higher value homes. In FY 2021, any home assessed at 437,200 or higher would pay more in taxes than if there was no residential exemption. The small commercial exemption is another option that helps some small businesses. In order to qualify for this, they would get it or they would get a 10% reduction in their value 
provided they meet two qualifications. They need an assessed, total assessed value of less than $1 million. And all businesses on that property have to have less than 10 annualized employees. For fiscal 21, there are 49 properties that qualify for this exemption, which would result in a $1,552,000 reduction in value because that share of the tax levy would still have to be made up by commercial. The tax rate would go from $12 to 1205 for commercial and industrial. The pros of a split tax rate, it results in lower tax values and higher property values. The cons of a split rate, the increased commercial and industrial and personal property taxes equal increased abatement applications, increased abatement applications equal increased expenses. A split rate must be voted every year and any override funded through a split rate could be placed back onto residential with a change in makeup of the board of select. This slide shows a cost of three cost of community services studies that were conducted. They're, they're fairly old at this point, but it shows that residential property uses more in services than they pay in taxes, while commercial and industrial and farming and open land use far less. This shows the American farmland study and the communities in Massachusetts that they used for the study. Most of the communities, the residential was a little bit under the $1.16 per dollar paid in taxes and the commercial and industrial are higher. This, this uh, slide shows the public safety and highway budgets in town because some people have stated that commercial and industrial use a disproportionate share of public safety and highway budgets, which they do. But if you look at this slide, it gives the total budget for public safety and highway at 3.6 million and our commercial, industrial and personal property pays 4.4 million. There are very few other services that commercial and industrial use besides public safety and highway. We've seen a large increase in commercial abatement in large commercial abatement filings in the past few years and the cost of handling a commercial abatement application is sizable. Even if the town prevails at the appellate tax board, it could cost the town between 10 and $60,000 per case. While splitting the rate will not increase revenue, it will increase expenses during the first few years that it is implemented. From talking to other communities that have a split rate, we have learned that there is a sizable increase in the commercial and industrial abatement applications in the first few years that it is implemented. While our CI and P values are fair, the filing of abatement applications and subsequent appeal to the ATB will cost the town a sizable amount of money. A standard commercial appeal will run the town thousands in legal costs. And while the assessor's personnel can testify before the ATB as to the characteristics of a property and how it was valued, we are not allowed to testify as expert witnesses to the value of the property. Any case that we don't settle would cost the town between 10 and 60,000 for an appraisal. These are costs that the town would incur even if we win the appeal. And the if the taxpayer wins, we would have thousands more in abated tax dollars. Are there any questions? No. Thank you for the presentation. All right, so what we're looking for is uh, a motion to set the tax rate at a certain dollar amount, which I believe is $12, right? Uh, what you actually what you want to do is vote the four recommendations on the assessor's FY21 classification report on page one, which is which to have a factor of one, which will be a $12 rate. And we're also recommending no open space discount, no residential exemption, and no small commercial exemption. So moved. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any further discussion? All right, Jennifer. I'll call the Phil. Yes. Chunglo. Yes. Stanley. 
Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, and Dan, while you're here, when, um, when, when are the next tax bills going out? Uh, so people can, and, and that would be the fourth quarter, right? Uh, third quarter bills will be mailed out right around Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yep. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. So let me get back to board box here. And uh, moving on, let's do uh, Library Fire Station Senior Center Update 7.1. Who wants to go first? Senior Center's fine. Short and sweet. All right. Yeah. Tub Fire Station is good. Nothing new to report there. All right. Christian, library? Library, uh, I think a lot of the issues that they had are have been resolved. Paving was done last Friday and striped over the weekend. I think there's still some signage that needs to go up for one way. I know that is confusing for people. So um, I don't think there are any arrows on the drive. I was going to look at the design and see if there was anything like that. I don't believe there are any kind of arrows that were supposed to be painted on the uh, the pavement uh, yeah. indicating the direction of travel, but there are going to be one-way signs put up. Christian, they just painted them on a driveway, actually. Oh, they did? Okay. Yeah. I didn't see. Yeah, I didn't look at it either. They're on the driveway right now. So. Okay. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah. I didn't know if that was happening or not. Um, and it was unclear from some emails I got. Um, so, yeah. And the library is moving in over there. Um, I haven't been made aware exactly of when they will be opening, but I'm sure that will be soon. I think the final certificate of occupancy is supposed to come soon, uh, but don't know exactly when. Okay. I would just like to say on all of the buildings, once they are done and you have an occupancy permit, we have a year to do a punch list and make sure that everything is running uh, like it should be. I think Mike has done a punch list up at the North Hadley sub fire station. So we are working on some just little things that uh, need to be worked on. And I would suggest that, you know, senior center in the library, once they have gotten their occupancy permits, um, do the same thing also, because you have that year time to do your punch list. We're working on it. Thank you. That's good. We don't want to let anything slip through. Uh, I've seen other projects that, you know, we didn't do that or whatever, and we want to make sure that we make sure that everything is good in a year. Thank you. So, um, all right, so that's it for those updates. Before we go into this last item of COVID updates, I just want to remind everybody, we're not using any names in this section if, it, if that comes up, all right? But um, we've had a... a bunch of requests from the paper and people making comments about uh, COVID in town. Uh, so to be forthright and you know transparent, we have one positive case of a town employee with COVID. Uh, that person was not at town meeting. So there's no need to be concerned if you were at town meeting that you were exposed to that person. So I just want to be clear about that. And uh, we did this week send all of our DPW employees out to be tested uh, just as a precaution. And we are following all the Board of Health guidelines in town as well as CDC guidelines. So I just wanted to put that out there to dispel the, the rumors. I've heard all kinds of stuff today that we've got dozens of cases in town employees. I don't know where these dozens of employees we have that are hiding, but <laughs> um, it, it's not true. So, uh, you know, we're working through it. We have a plan in place for all of our employees. HR has approved it. We've approved it. The uh, town administrator has, has approved it. So, you know, we're following the plan as this stuff comes up. And I'm sure more of it will unfortunately come up in the future as uh, we go through the, you know, flu season and cold season. So um, hopefully that covers most of it. Uh, Carolyn, did you want to add anything to that? No, it's unmuted now, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, no, it, it, honestly, I, I think, um, I, I'm not sure where all those numbers came from, but um, to add to that, there is, yes, one employee outside of a department that was exposed but is self-quarantined. So everyone has followed what has been suggested, and we've worked with uh, the Unified Command group, and it, I just think that the department has worked really well together that we're on Unified Command um, to, put, to, to provide all of the safety measures to have, make sure they were put in place. And um, I'm really confident that we were almost over cautious, but I think that's good. And I think other towns who, ha who have yet, not yet faced this, um, they're, they're all in the same boat and talking to each other to see how things are going. So um, I'm confident Hadley made all of the right decisions with this. And, and I think I'm yeah. positive that everybody were, is comfortable me, and feeling safe. Let me yeah. say you can never be overcautious with okay. this. <laughs> Thank right. you. Carol, Caroline, I'd really like to see a unified command stay active you know, until we feel comfortable or everyone feels comfortable uh, that we can get back to some sort of normal. So if something happens, we can activate a little bit quicker than we did this time uh, with so, the other incident. I see uh, the fire chief's on here as well, so he might want to chime in. But um, so Unified Command, uh, initially when COVID started, we were meeting I think on a daily basis for a number of weeks. Um, and then we reduced that number. We were meeting weekly. And then we started after we kind of got into the group of things, we were meeting on an as needed basis. And the way that works, and the chief can jump in here, but anybody can call a unified command meeting that's, that's on the team. So uh, when, when this issue popped up, uh, I'm not sure who called it. I think it was uh, maybe, maybe Carolyn, I'm not sure. But we, uh, we did have a meeting and we met and we discussed it. And, uh, you know, Board of Health was there, Fire Chief, Town Administrator, myself, um, DPW Director. And so, you know, we, we worked as quickly as we could to get things in order. Um, like anything else, some of this stuff takes time. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we had to find a location to get everybody tested at because there was one location people went to and they ran out of tests halfway through the day. So we have those things in place now. Board of Health just sent out a email this afternoon that they have a certain number of tests in hand. So if we have something like this pop up with town employees, you know, we have tests on hand that can be condu conducted by town employees. So a little bit more flexibility. So that way they don't have to go wait for hours in line at, you know, Cooley or the mall, one of those places. So, um, Chief Spankel, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we are still considered under a state of emergency. So our unified command team has not been disband disbanded, nor will it until the chair of the select board determines that we no longer need to be under that state of emergency. So it was decided to do it as a as needed basis, just because we are also inundated with stuff as it is. And it can be called by any member of the Unified Command team based upon information that's received. So as soon as we receive the information, we scheduled that for that Monday and put together a plan. And we got some really good updated information from the governor's office, as well as uh, working with the Board of Health on some additional items that we'll be looking at either myself at one of their meetings or via Zoom uh, so that we can expand upon this. This is a it grows and it shrinks, as you can see, daily. Either we have a lot of cases or we have a low number of cases. Right now, we, it seems to be increasing. Um, but we are evaluating that still daily. Thank you. So you had a question? Who? Yeah, can, you, uh, can we make sure to update the website under the COVID banner? to what's going on. Um, I've had a number of people who've called who, who are like, this is like old, old, old information. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I tend to know what's going on from our meetings, but. Isn't yeah. it, isn't it the board of health that should be updating on the COVID 
So unified command gets together and puts together that unified command message mm -hmm. and it has been updated. Uh, it was actually updated probably maybe a week ago, but it's general guidance of where to go on the state's website because that's the most accurate information. We actually mm -hmm. took down all of the, originally we had each division reporting. Uh, but it was just so, there was too much information there for people to process. So we streamlined it. Jennifer and I um, worked on just putting in uh, the direct link to the governor's um, and then if there's anything that we need to put in uh, locally, that would be amended in that, that form. Okay. Because, I, uh, it, you know, folks tend to call me and go, what's going on? And it, then it's like, check the website. So, okay. It's been updated three times in the last week with the fact that town halls open for appointments, with the um, update from Mike, with the tips for how to have a safe Thanksgiving. Okay. So it, it is being updated. Um, it doesn't have the red emergency banner anymore because that was stopping us from alerting people about other things, you know, the DPW and things like that that also needed it. So that's, okay. that was a that's change. Maybe, maybe it doesn't feel as urgent. What, uh, why I've been getting calls. So, because the banner is not up there. Okay. Uh, well, one thing we're not doing because it's, it's uh, you know, we're not going to publish, you know, uh, one employee here came down with COVID. That's just not productive in any way. Um, so I've had people asking me that of why, why wasn't the town notified that somebody in the DPW or somebody in town hall or somebody somewhere had COVID? Um, it's called HIPAA. It. It's called right, HIPAA. Right. Yeah. Right. People so are not about put... HIPAA. So just say the word <laughs> HIPAA, David. <laughs> right. So the, the website is for general information about the town response, about updated guidance, things along those lines. So don't don't expect names and addresses of people up there. Sorry. <laughs> HIPAA. Unless Yay. Joyce, then we're putting her name and address up there. Put my name, put and I will answer it appropriately. No problem. Just give them my email. No problem. <laughs> Anybody else have anything for a COVID update uh, they want to jump in on? Nothing. Okay. That's all I have on the agenda. If anybody has any announcements or any unanticipated business. I, I do have a couple of announcements if I could. Jane, did you have something before the announcements? Just, I'd like to have the dates of the next few meetings before we leave. Oh. Uh, let me pull them up here. That would be December 2nd. Yep. And the two weeks after that 16th and that's it for december yeah, and then january 6th would be the next one for 2021 sounds good um all right so go ahead with your announcements joyce thank you i think i would like to start off with uh thanking publicly the fire department uh for setting up for town meeting and uh, police department for being involved in that and the DPW uh, and making it safe for everybody that went. The Board of Health was also there on board. Uh, I would like to uh, actually ask um, everybody to just appreciate what we have here in town and everybody trying to work together. So I thank everybody because it was perfectly safe. Everybody was well distanced and we all wore mask and did everything appropriately that we were supposed to do for this COVID um, pandemic that we're going through right now. So again, kudos to all of our people um, that helped us with this process. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I have two uh, uh, from the Board of Selectmen. We'd like to offer our condolences to the family of Veronica Kozlikowski, uh, North Hadley resident that raised her family there. She also won uh, five children, uh, one of them being Ann Russell that lives in North Hadley and her uh, son, uh, which would be Veronica's grandson, Ray, who works for our DPW. We offer our sincere condolences for her passing. Um, sadly, Martha Boisvert passed away this week. She was the cornerstone of the Boisvert farm and 
Sugar Shacks, the co-founder of the Sugar Shack, and um, raised really three wonderful children, Ginny, uh, John, and um, Joe. And, uh, you know, she just was an all-around participant in the town for our Holy Rosary and teaching catechism and many other good things that she did. And she was a really good person, as, as Veronica was too. But, I mean, Martha we saw at the Sugar Shack all the time. And um, I certainly want to wish our condolences to their family on their passing. So, uh, especially at this time of the year. So, condolences to everybody. Anybody else? All right. Well, um, if I can get a motion to adjourn. Make a motion well, to adjourn. And a second. Motion to adjourn and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And a second. Second, 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 please. I second it. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear. It. All right. And uh, Jennifer, roll call. Bill? Yes. Chunglo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Moskevitz? Yes. Thank right. you. Happy Thanksgiving. See you on December 2nd. Yep. And everybody, everybody be safe, please. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.